Banks, you know that XL Bullies have really been in the news this last week. Well, that's why we're jumping on Zoom now to speak to Dr. Roger Mugford, who, as well as being an animal psychologist, dog behaviorist, he has also been an expert witness in court defending dogs under the Dangerous Dogs Act. I'm Anna Webb. Welcome to A Dog's Life. Dr. Roger Mugford, what an absolute delight that you've joined us on A Dog's Life. Well, it's a privilege to be with you, Anna, and, and listeners too. Well, it's very important to be chatting to you really right now, because apart from being the only person that's ever trained the Queen's Corgis from the outside, the late amazing Queen's Corgis, you've done everything with dogs. You are really the godfather, I would say, you know, of dog training and dog behaviour. Well, my own dog, Dave, doesn't think so. Um, but uh, <laughs> I've worked with dogs for 43 years and actually before that in, in a research capacity. So I suppose I've been around dogs uh, professionally for 50 years. And uh, I started off as a wee, a wee Devon lad with uh, the family farm dogs. Uh, so uh, do dogs are in my genes, if you like. Yes. And, you know, you actually have a firm called the Company of Animals, which I think is such a great name because the Company of Animals broadens our view on the world, uh, helps with so much understanding and dogs give so much back to us, don't they, to enrich our lives? Yeah. And my interest only and not only in d dogs, uh, you know, I'm a farming background and I still farm. Um, so I'm very interested in wildlife connections with human behaviour. Uh, and I, I love cats as well. I love uh, all sorts of animals. Um, but primarily, I've become known for my work with dogs, both resolving behavioural problems in dogs and especially fe featuring or focusing upon dangerous dogs or dogs that bite for whatever reason. And of course, that could be a dog of any description and from any background. Yes. And in the news this week, of course, everybody knows that Rishi Sunak has just added a breed to the Dangerous Dogs Act, the American XL bully. And you were really around at the time when this knee jerk legislation was introduced in 1991. So you must be seeing so many parallels at the moment. I did groan when I heard the Home Secretary and then followed shortly by the Prime Minister. And I just saw it as the same sort of political expediency that accompanied Kenneth Baker's um, featuring um, a ban on pit bulls and a number of other breeds, of course. Back in the debate began in 1989 with the sad death of a little girl, or the severe mauling of a little girl called Ruxana Khan in, in Bradford. Um, and I was called by the Home Office to comment upon that and to suggest what could be done to reduce or contain or prevent dog fighting and the further importation of this breed, the American Pit Bull Terrier. And I, I thought it, a ban at that time sounded like a really good idea. What better way that, to stop dog biting than just say you, you're not allowed to own dogs that fight uh, Pit Bull Terriers and, and, and it prevent their importation? Um, well, I soon learned the errors of my ways, as did all of those associated with that flawed legislation in 1991. Well, yes, because it hasn't solved the problem at all. And dog bites, it seems, statistically have gone up massively year on year, even with this legislation that's meant to protect the public. Yes. In, in, uh, I mean, uh, there are a number of reasons why dog bites have apparently gone up. But one, I'm sure, is the threshold for reporting dog bites has changed uh, society is a, a, a lot more gentle and a lot more prone to report anything that goes wrong, um, um, be, be it you know, a cyclist uh, riding on a, a pavement, a sidewalk, or uh, a, any minor transgression, if you like, is much more likely to be reported now. In the past, you'd have just had a firm word with, with, with some sort of mild criminal act. Um, so now people are really keen to report on their neighbours um, and the threshold for reporting a dog bite is much lower, partly because people think they can make money out of um, uh, having been um, injured no matter how tiny by dog bite. Some, sometimes the, these insurance claims are based on em emotional distress caused by a dog bite. So um, don't believe the dog bite statistics that you hear from any source, uh, but 
look, one death, one by this, um, serious dog bite is horrific and uh, and needs to be properly focused upon. Uh, um, and allegedly, there were six dog-related deaths last year, which is horrific and, and a, a large number. And you know, one will be too, far too many. Uh, in America, something of the order sixty plus, so 10 times as many are killed in America. And there's a lot of evidence about the reasons why certain dogs bite and even kill people. Um, and they've been much more focused on understanding the reasons why dogs do what they do. I mean, why is it, Roger? I mean, are genetics to play in this or is it all down to nurture and training and, well, a lack of really training and socialisation? Well, genetics are certainly a, a big factor. Uh, you know, I've been bitten by Dachshund. I've been bitten by German Shepherd. Uh, uh, I've been threatened by all sorts of dogs. Uh, size is a predominant factor, and size clearly has a genetic cause, if you like. You breed for big dogs, little dogs. And undoubtedly, there is a genetic basis to, we we'll call it, g- general personality. So a Border Collie has a different personality than a, a phlegmatic uh, Great Dane. But there are enormous variations within each breed. And broadly speaking, there is a category of behaviour that we'll call canine, which is shared by all dogs. Um, now, a, a propensity to be aggressive is certainly one of those traits dogs are hierarchical creatures they are brought up within a pack which they include human beings within that pack and um, they're more friendly to people whom they know that are if you like pack members and less friendly to people outside um, now those tendencies how wide or broad a dog's uh, generosity if you like of spirit is spread uh, across all human beings um, is determined by early social experience by socialization so uh, a puppy that's brought up with a lot of people in the family and visitors and goes to puppy classes and has more nice experience won't have discovered uh, anything about aggression or the need to be um, protective of of, of, it, of its family or of its pack animals that are not well socialized uh, will tend to be more suspicious of strangers and, and that is the basis of uh, dogs that become dangerous uh, well socialized well trained well managed dogs are not dangerous so roger do you think you know because everything's based on type and on tape measures that many innocent dogs like say a Great Dane who might be mixed with a Labrador might get seized well exactly um, the, the, the 1991 legislation sorry to go back all that time um, was dis- was defined in really vague terms um, you know precisely what was type what was an American pit bull terrier so things ended up in court and a lovely man called Gary Dunn was had his dog seized and and I was on the defense team and it was my first if you like working experience of the enacting the very legislation that I had encouraged the then home secretary to introduce and Gary's dog wouldn't hurt a fly it was a lovely dog I've forgotten his name Paul Paul Gary and his dog ended up literally in the crown court which was uh, at that time based in Kensington just at the back of Harrods and um Absolutely ridiculous things were being said by an expert witness provided by the RSPCA and by a vet. Um, and basically, the word type was uh, accepted by the court as meaning a broad, having a broad meaning as more or less thereabouts, just about. Uh, that's, those sorts of uh, words were used in the mm. court judgment. And from there on, any dog that was a Staffordshire Bull Terrier or was, as you say, a cross between a the Great Dane and a boxer or a boxer and anything could be seized as being of the pit bull type. Now, with the not very well considered announcement by uh, the Home Secretary, so uh, um, Braverman and the Prime Minister, is that if you use the word type, it will encompass every conceivable bull breed, right, starting from the good old... Uh, John Bull, English Bulldog, right up to the legally owned uh, American Bulldog, which is a, a tall, fine-looking dog, like a miniature Great Dane. 
um, and and with uh, floppy lips and floppy ears too. So the the, the scary looking pictures that you see of, of XL American bullies um, seem to have some distinctiveness, but actually the ones that I've seen in rescue at Battersea and the like um, vary enormously. You know, I, people think that they're buying um, an XL bully that it is some defined type. Go on, well, I won't tell you the website, but you go online and look at all the XL bullies that are for sale. Incredible variation. Um, uh, some very tall, some very broad headed, uh, some with lots of wrinkles on their nose like an English bulldog, some not very dissimilar to an American bulldog or a Great Dane. Um, are all of these going to be forbidden? Just imagine we're talking probably three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dogs potentially could come within the orbit or of the definition of an XL bully. And it's so scary, isn't it? I mean, this is potentially going to cost taxpayers, UK taxpayers, multi-millions of pounds, you know, court fees, kenneling fees after these dogs have been taken away. And the other awful thing is, what about XL bullies that are living, you know, with responsible owners, living responsible lives, they've never heard to fly? How would these people get their dogs back? Or are these dogs doomed as well? They will be doomed. Um, already, um, responsible animal charities like the Dogs Trust and um, the, the RSPCA and uh, um, Battersea say that they are receiving lots of these dogs or lots of big floppy-eared uh, drooly type. Yeah. <laughs> you, can tell I, you can tell I don't own one. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't give them this unpleasant description but they are they're very drooly um, dogs um, that they're being overwhelmed with their numbers um, and the, the possibility of finding new homes for these reject dogs is very remote. So guess what? They will be euthanized. Um, and uh, it's such a tragedy. Uh, uh, people who are walking their bulldog cross, let's call them that, down the street are being stopped and people are avoiding them for yeah. no reason at all. Um, and um, as we say, it's the deed, not the breed. Undoubtedly, the deed of a dog that's aggressive is, is awful come to somebody like me and lots of other you know well-informed dog trainers and and behaviorists who are there to help you but um the the thought of involving the police or inverted commas experts um criminalizing owners on the basis of their dog's appearance is utterly ridiculous um, and uh, it's you know a, a, dare i say a piece of political expediency to make it appear that um, the government have a finger in every pie, looking after our best interests and uh, will react to the latest news story. Well, I'm sorry, this is not the right reaction. The right reaction is to really have a public education campaign to encourage people to uh, think carefully before they buy any dog. Um, and, and of course, we've seen a big uh, increase in dog numbers owned, um, probably of the order 20 30 percent increase since covid and for very good reasons pe people have really discovered the pleasure and the companionship and the psychological um, benefits of of having a dog in the family we don't want to change that these are you know unpaid social workers no matter what the breed and, and once you've been imprinted upon a puppy or a dog in your family uh, it becomes one of the family it is one of your children and to have the thought of uh, some interfering social administrator, call it the police, say, uh, removing that animal from your loving family context is horrific. On a practical level, Roger, so anyone listening that maybe has got a boxer cross Labrador sat at their feet and just wants to convey the right impressions to people in the current uh, vibe, would you recommend muzzle? as being because I read many years ago of course that the dog that's muzzled in the park is actually the safest dog in the park <laughs> yes and, and yet the prejudice against muzzles which is yeah. entirely understandable is that people take a wide detour if they see a dog with a muzzle Look, I know. <laughs> um, my little company of animals uh, produces more muzzles than any other company on the planet um, uh, and uh, I, I dare not say the name of it well I will it's called the basketball muzzle and <laughs> yeah. it was specifically crafted for American pit bull terriers originally but now it encompasses all shapes and sizes of dogs um, but does it include giant excessive 
uh, uh, brachycephalic, that means it's short-nosed uh, uh, um, XL bullies. Well, it's a challenge, and we are having to redesign uh, our range of muzzles to accommodate uh, these extreme large dogs. Um, I would also include um, breeds like uh, Japanese Tozers, uh, and um, I've already mentioned the dogs of the Bordeaux, really gigantic heads. They do represent a challenge. But look, no, no matter if you have a Pastor Jack Russell Terrier, a Poodle, a um, XL Bully, um, it's a good idea that you get your dog used to wearing a muzzle. Why? Not just because um, it's the responsible thing to do when out in the park, and most dogs don't need a, a muzzle in the park, but a trip to the vet, your dog is injured, it gets a, an injury to its paw and you have to address it, and it doesn't like its paws being held or, or being attended to by a vet. Every dog needs to be adapted to wearing a muzzle. And yes, yes if you think your dog just may come to the attention of uh, uh, this present Conservative administration, and then uh, you should be looking for a muzzle. And outside this podcast, uh, contact me personally, contact my company of animals. Uh, we are working on it. Bring your dog out to us. We're in Leafy, Chertsey, out uh, west of London. And uh, we will endeavour to give your dog a personal muzzle fitting. It is something that clearly government haven't thought about, we are thinking about it. I'm working with Battersea and, and other responsible rehoming agencies to find the, uh, the sizes and types of muzzles that will, will be required if this staff law is enacted. Because, as I say, there is no one single head shape or type of um, uh, XL bully. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So we've got to have the variety of muzzles uh, needed if this becomes law but let's hope that common sense prevails mm. and uh, and that these politicians will move on to some other matter of public interest and concern like uh, uh, electric cars versus um, petrol cars or uh, who knows what well, yes, um, as we speak, there's been a change in, in all of that as well in, in this week's news. So we're living in such a time of high news stories, you know, that that's my hope that things will calm down, Roger, and people see sense. And I'm, I'm just realised that perhaps, you know, we're living with more dogs now in our lives than ever before since records began, Roger. So dogs are part of society now, and that's fantastic. So they need to be recognised. And I just think a lot more power needs to go to local authorities you know bringing back the dog license it surely is a good idea if it's done properly and then funds are channeled to local authorities to offer training sessions you know groups you know fun evenings fun dog shows free community events to get people together and offer the sound advice look Anna um, I, I want to appoint you as the president <laughs> of the of a happy society that we all aspire to um but you're absolutely right um but I would simply say to um, listen to this podcast that you and you know, out there that uh, having a dog, owning a dog, is a privilege. It's not a right. Um, you know, we have an in, an incredible responsibility to ensure that our dog ownership does no harm to others. I, I say the same, by the way, to horse owners, um, uh, and uh, that means that uh, collecting revenue taxes from dogs is a reasonable thing to do as long as they're, they're spent, those funds are spent to the benefit of dogs and dog owners. Now this happens in most European societies and, and the tax in Switzerland upon the first dog is modest, on the second dog is, is slightly more on the third and, and thereafter it becomes a bit steep. And um, so, you know, one dog owner in your family, two even, um, exerts its amazing psychological therapeutic influence and when you when you have a kennel full of dogs out back yapping away and annoying the neighbors and pooping in the park and um, then it becomes a potentially a social nuisance so it i think bringing back the dog license and uh, taxation if you like um, set at some modest fee like five ten pounds um, is right the dog warden service uh, tends to be one of the services which local authorities cut back on when they're short of funds and um, 
you know, Birmingham, Woking and many other um, local authorities are going bankrupt because they can't afford to pay for all the things that the local government has to do. And well, like, for goodness sake, dog owners and find some small sum of money that you will pay for the privilege of having a dog. Um, so that stray dogs are better cared for. It's not just a matter of the big animal charities. Uh, we have a properly funded dog warden service um, and, of course, intervene when people are irresponsible, cruel, neglectful of dogs. Um, dogs need protection from bad people. It's just a shame, isn't it, that it seems that the XL bully has been adopted by the bad people, you know, the people that like to intimidate or do dog fighting, which is horrific and illegal. So if you know, but they're going to always have a dog. So if, if it's not the XL bully, it'll be another breed in a year's time. And they're probably manu well, manufacturing, crossing the dogs at the moment. So, and we're yeah. all back to square one where Rushi Sunak's foolishly said type. And then that is the problem now. Indeed, and I'm old enough and some viewers may even, listeners may even be as old as me, um, I won't give my age on there. And um, that uh, in the 50s, it was Dobermans were really bad. Or no, so German Shepherds. And then it was Dobermans. Then it was Rottweilers. And then it was something else. And then it was Pitbulls. And that now it's XL Bullies. So there are these fashions. And uh, Jeremy Clarkson, who's a fellow farmer like me, um, in the Sunday Times uh, wrote, uh, let's have a wolf, uh, an XL wolf tronic. In other words, go back, let's have some wolves and let's crossbreed them and make them even bigger and looking oh. ferocious and uh, oh. <laughs> and fit in with a digital age and scary scariness. Um, in, in other words, there is another type breed of dog around the corner, which um, silly people will dream up. Um, and for goodness sake, uh, we've just had an explosion in popularity of uh, poodle crosses, labradoodles, um, uh, cavapoos and the like, and, and th those lists that, that, that have one, they're, they're pretty good. Sometimes their personalities are a bit colourless, but what lovely little family animals, pets they make. So that was such a big change in fashion. In fact, the ownership of big dogs like Labradors and the like, is somewhat on the decline because it's been filled, uh, that void has been filled by these little personalised crossbreeds or by thousands, thousands of dogs being imported from the likes of Romania and other uh, less fortunate countries in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. And there is a massive trade in badly socialised, basically feral dogs captured off the street uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, and th these are dangerous dogs because they're not socialised, they're not trained, they haven't been habituated to urban living. Um, but people, inverted commas, rescue, adopt them, and they can make very unsatisfactory pets. Many of them make lovely pets as well. But um, there is no filtering, no proper assessment of these dogs. Um, and by their lack of early positive education, these dogs become dangerous. And that is, to repeat what I was say, saying earlier, uh, that the importance of early experience and responsible dog ownership, uh, informed dog ownership, is so important in addressing this issue about responsible dog ownership. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, you know, Roger, you're absolutely right. It is about the right exposure around people, really. That's the key thing for dogs, man's best friend. And and we mustn't let them down. <laughs> no, um, and there are so many other dangers in society. You know, I drive a silent electric car. Is that good or is it bad? Well, it's sort of its carbon footprint is less, but I can creep up behind a cyclist and scare him or a pedestrian or indeed a dog. Um, you know, you don't hear the rumble of a, of a petrol engine. Um, we have really serious dangers on the roads uh, all the time. Uh, and, and dogs are in that scheme of things, much less. And um, many more people are injured, maimed, and a few die from lawnmowers. Many die from driving electric scooters and, and 30, 40 per year die from falling off horses, uh, not just uh, in, in uh, the, the Cheltenham Gold Cup type races, but just, you know, leisure horses. Um, are we going to ban horses? Because many, many more people are killed than by dogs.
Gosh, that's so interesting. I hadn't actually thought about that figure. Is it really that high? Forty people die on their own pet horse on a on an average yeah. hack. <laughs> it is, and and uh, here I am, Roger Mugford, animal expert, farmer. I was nearly killed by one of my own cows five years ago. I was rescued by my lovely Romanian farm worker, um, but uh, I, I was uh, treating, attending to her calf, but she took exception to me. So again. About seven farmers, or actually three or four farmers per year, are killed by their own cows, and I was nearly one of them. Oh. Uh, and and many more dog owners are killed by cows when they walk through a field with with young cows, and not necessarily mother cows defending their calves, which is my situation, but simply because cows hate dogs because dogs are wolves. And they will attack the dog. And by inference, they will attack the person at the other end of the lead. Um, so, again, are we, what, are we going to ban cows? We have to rely upon people's knowledge of cow behavior and to avoid walking their dog in through a field of cows. And that's how we should address this issue about um, XL bullies. Yes, absolutely. Education and, and looking at the cause rather than putting sticky plasters on the symptom. I, I know that um, we have been through an amazing time of positivity and attitudes towards pet ownership in general, not just dogs, but cats and d d house bunnies and all sorts of, and, and wildlife, nature, you know, the robin that comes to see me every morning when I go out in the garden to feed my chickens. I have a pet robin, he's out there, and I, I talk to him because I'm stupid. Um, but, you know, connection with the animal world is part of our generosity of the human spirit and it needs to be developed and nurtured and not seen as something that is um, bad for society or or eccentric or to be un unnecessarily regulated um let's if you have a dog it takes you out into the countryside it connects you with nature and and that's as, as true of a little jack russell terrier as of a of a giant uh, xl bully Exactly, Roger. Well, look, let's um, maybe have a catch up and, uh, and let's see how all this unravels. And it would be brilliant to chat again on A Dog's Life. I'm very privileged to be here and talking with you. Um, and uh, any of you, the listeners to this podcast that want to reach me in person, reach out to me. All the links are in the show notes, Rog. I'm very accessible. And I will give time to anybody who is in need or in distress because of what their dog does. That's that's my job. It's brilliant down on your farm and um, your expertise is worth trillions and, and billions. And yes, I'm looking forward to seeing um, these new big muzzles because they come in different colours, don't they? They are. <laughs> We're developing muzzles that you can barely see on the dog that are invisible. Uh, and yes, and pink muzzles with, that you can attach flowers to, and blue for boys, and um, uh, you know muzzles that function. That's the most important thing. But also muzzles that are comfortable, and that muzzles that don't look quite so scary. Exactly. Oh, well, thank you, Roger. And listen, all the links are in the show notes. So I hope you'll be back again soon. A pleasure, Anna. Our show, Mr. Binks. What did you think? Yes, I agree with you that this legislation really shouldn't become law. And yes, you're right. It is time for Woof of the Week. <coughs> Please remember not to judge a book by its cover and to understand that dogs should be judged on the deed, not the breed. <coughs> I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, go on, rate and review the show wherever you tune into your podcasts. And a big thank you, of course, to Dr. Roger Mugford for joining us today. And all the links to Roger and his company are in the show notes. Thanks, of course, to Mike Hansen, my producer, for all the music and production as ever. You can find out more about him at Pod People UK. And for me, I'm just at Anna Webb Dogs. What's that, Mr. Binks? Yes, gosh, you're right. We will be back in your feed next Sunday. So go on, subscribe. It's free. And that way you'll never miss another show. Bye for now.